Okay. Check. This is RF3. Oh, can I can I have more volume on this one, please? Check, check. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, this, mm, yeah, this is good. Uh, yeah. yeah, nice. Can I get a little more volume on the tabla? Can I get a little more bass? A little more volume on this microphone which is pointing towards the left hand drum. More bass, more uh, lower mids. And more gain as well on this one. I guess this microphone is very good. The, the volume on this microphone is good. I need a little more volume on this one, on, on the one pointing to the...
Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's master class, Clinic Sarangi, The Sound of Hundred Colors. I'm Rekha Menon, Professor of Art History from the Liberal Arts Department. Berkeley is so happy and honored to welcome Dr. Deepak Parmashivan on Sarangi and Megha Sham Keshav on Tabla to be with us today as part of our Visiting Artists series. Before I introduce the artists, I want to thank the Liberal Arts Department, especially Dr. Simon Pilon, Chair of the Liberal Arts Department, and Dr. Shukla from <coughs> LearnQuest Academy of Music in helping to make this event possible. The event is sponsored by LearnQuest and uh, Academy of Music and the Liberal Arts Department. And want to thank the staff at Cafe 939 Red Room for helping us with the arrangements to make this event possible. And for us. Without further ado, a brief introduction. Dr. Deepak Parmashivan is a well-known Sarangi player, composer, singer, and actor. He released his Indo Jazz Fusion album titled The Jazz Sutra in June 2019. He had his training in vocal and theater music from his father, R. Parmashivan, and Mysore style Veena from D. Balakrishna. He learned the Sarangi from Mr. Faiz Khan and trained under maestros like Pandit Ram Narayan and Pandit Durba Ghosh. He continues to learn from the world renowned sitar and tabla maestro, Pandit Nayan Ghosh. He has performed in Europe, USA, Canada, UK. New Zealand, uh, to name a few, South Korea too, both as a soloist and collaborating with the world-renowned artists such as Ustad Ashish Khan, Pandit Anindo Chatterjee, to name a few, and also Pandit Bridju Maharaj. He has played the Sarangi for the Oscar-winning composer A.R. Rahman's Roli, Seaboard, and for the Hollywood music director Rick Boston's upcoming movie, Messiah. He's a recipient of the Killian Award and Ruth Stewart Award and Edmonton Arts Council Award, to name a few. Deepak has a PhD, and this is really interesting. He has a PhD in energy and climate engineering with a gold medal from Indian Institute of Science. It's one of the prestigious institutes. After serving a stint at the University of Alberta as a climate scientist, he switched gears, and he recently <laughs> is all into music and has a PhD in music from the University of Alberta, Canada. Megha Sham Keshav had his initial musical training from Pandit Vishwanath Nakod, later from Pandit Udaya Raj Karpur and Ravindra Yavagal, and at present from Master Maestro Pandit Anindo Chatterjee. Have also, he's also mastered the complex ryth rhythmic patterns on the Mridangam, he has performed in several prestigious venues and has accompanied several famous artists. Interesting also, Megha Sham has two careers. He balances his profession as a software engineer and his passion for his art and uh, playing the tabla. We thank Dr. Deepak Parmashivan and Megha Sham Kesha for being with us today. And I thank the audience <laughs> for being with us today and for this wonderful presentation. Towards the end of the presentation, I guess, I'm sure the artists will welcome questions from the audience. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks very much, <coughs> uh, Professor Rekaji. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Shukla and uh, my dear friend, Mekhisham. In fact, our relationship goes back 30 years. And we, we grew up in the same locality in India. And this is, is my brother from another mother. <coughs> in fact, our artistic career also thrived simultaneously. <coughs> I've been given strict instructions to talk less and play more. So <laughs> I'll stick to that. and. Uh, um, how much time you want for the Q and A? Q and A. No, no, I don't know. No, <laughs> yeah. no it, it's good to you know play more and talk less. <coughs> Sometimes, yeah, she said 
doctorates have a problem to go tangential. We want to talk about everything. <coughs> so I'll play a little bit of what is known as the alap. Okay. Check. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is uh, improvise it. Uh, people, are, oh yeah, <laughs> it's uh, an improvisatory uh, piece that is performed in Indian classical music, which is not set to rhythm. So this will give you an introduction about how the sarangi sounds, and then we'll have a little chat, and uh, then uh, I'll explain how sarangi is uh, employed in, in different genres of music, and we'll have a short solo with my friend uh, Megashamji because this instrument is used as uh, an accompaniment instrument. It was predominantly an accompaniment instrument for a long time, and it was only in the 20th century that it was <coughs> its status was elevated to a solo instrument by uh, Ustad Bundu Khan and uh, my teacher, Pandit Ram Narayan, who adopted different genres of Indian classical music, like Drupad and Khayal, and he uh, made this into a solo instrument. I'll play a rag uh, called Kiravani, which is the melodic uh, minor. So, oh, how many of, okay, I thought of you know, having a short, uh, you know, interact, interactive session wherein we can make some music together towards the end. So uh, is everyone familiar with singing or some kind of percussion? So I hope so, also, oh, fantastic. Yeah, we'll try something towards the end. <clears throat>
So this uh, improvisatory piece was called the Alap, in which the melody is uh, uh, quite contrary to the accepted notion that it's all purely improvised. Yes, it is purely improvised, but there is a method in madness. So uh, there is a system of improvisation called the Mirkhand, which I'll explain in a bit. And now a short introduction about this instrument. This instrument is called Sarangi. There are various theories about the origin of this instrument. The most popularly accepted theory is that it is derived from the word Saurangi, which means 100 colors because of the uncanny ability of this instrument to depict all the emotions that are depicted through the human voice. Which is why this was for a long time an accompaniment instrument for vocal music. Because it's, the sound is very close to the human voice and you can, you can play everything. And so sometimes a sarangi player can play more than what the vocalist can sing. Which is why they were, for a long time, they were dreaded. You know, vocalists didn't want to sing with a good sarangi player <clears throat> because he could easily outsmart them. There's a saying in Hindi, Savagavaya, which means he's one quarter of a singer. If a singer has 100% uh, efficiency, a sarangi player will have 125%. Because he's been playing with so many different schools, different genres, different singers. So sometimes if the vocalist forgot a line in a composition, a sarangi player would prompt him. Because he has accompanied someone at some point in time. And uh, it's a crazy instrument, I would say. Uh, so one of my teachers used to say that if you become a sarangi player, you should be willing to live in a state of perpetual depression. <laughs> because uh, this instrument is played with the cuticle beneath your nail. So here, you know, that the juncture of nail and where the skin meets it. So when you start playing, it is it bleeds and you know, like a martial artist, you don't know whether you're learning Kung Fu or learning the Sarangi because you put your hand in hot sand to toughen it and then you will get those calluses and then it becomes tough. And you need, it has 40 strings, four zero, and you need to tune all of them. And uh, every time you play a melody, you need to retune the instrument, you change the melody, you retune the instrument. So my guru, the first advice that he gave me was never tune the instrument on the stage. So he used to share a joke for the first time when Sarangi came here. It seems after the tuning was done, people thought the concert is over and they started applauding. <laughs> because it takes a lot of time to tune all those instruments and get those subtle tones. And you undergo a rigorous training in vocal music before you start performing the Sarangi. Uh, that's, and it's played with uh, a bow. And uh, there are three gut strings, which are the three main playing strings. Now I use the, uh, the harp, harp gut, and uh, 37 sympathetic strings. So, and this sound is because of the sympathetic string, you know, the strings that you tune in different frequencies, and when you play that note, that string vibrates because it's in unison, for example. Now, So it has a natural resonance. Now, uh, talking about the improvisatory technique, <clears throat> we usually employ what is known as a mirkhand padhati which is a simple permutation combination based technique. So I'll give you an example, let us consider, uh, I hope all of you are familiar with, so I'm sure you're moving to the mid middle of the semester so you know the seven notes, sargam and all that, right? So just like the solfege, you know, do re mi fa, we have the corresponding notes, sare uh, padani. And what is distinct uh, from, if you compare it to the Western music or jazz is that, 
mean, you can't stick to the 2 5 1 or uh, such chord progressions in Indian classical music. So we say, for example, in jazz, uh, Lydian in D or Mixolydian in F and so on. We don't do that. It's a one side, decide the tonic. So this drone gives me the tonic, and each instrument is tuned to a different tonic. For example, Sarangi sounds its best when it is tuned to the tonic of E. So any melody that I play, it's all in E. It's E mixolydian, E lydian, E phrygian, any, any, any melody that you play, it's always in E. With some, some changes, which is known as the Madhyam Tat, in which the fourth becomes the tonic, which is usually played in, in light forms of music. But otherwise, so you, you play any rag, uh, I wish I had a presentation, but it's okay. This is better, you know, informal. Uh, Lydian scale corresponds to a rock called Yemen. And Aeolian corresponds to a rock called, uh, it's a Natubhairavi. Uh, in the uh, Carnatic system and in the Hindustani system, it's called Asavari. <coughs> so if I'm playing Lydian, the whole concert is in Lydian. I don't change the scale at all. So all the phraseology, the ragas are constructed in such a way that it keeps reflecting the true character of Lydian throughout. In this case, it's Kiravani. So whatever phrase I play, so each raga is identified by its key phrases, just like the quality of a chord. It's like the color tone. So you have these chord tones and color tones. And so in the same way, uh, every raga has its color. It has its key. For example, da -da 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 -da, immediately you know that it's minor, E minor. In the same way, it's a key signature characteristic phrase of this rag. And these phrases, you know, you hear more and more and more and more, you learn from your teacher, it will become your second nature, which come handy when you are improvising. So these phrases are all, it's like learning a language, you know, different phrases you learn. And when you want to express a new idea, you don't have to really look for ways of expressing it because you know it already, it is internalized in you. So you just pick the right word and make a statement. It's this, in the same way you, you know these phrases of the raga. Which, so each raga has a is, is a language in itself. So you learn that language, each raga you spend, dwell on it for a couple of months, sometimes six months. And then you know all the subtleties, all the different expressions. So the moment you start playing, so these expressions, they keep coming to your mind in different combinations and you start improvising on it. And as I said, there is one more technique called the Meerkhand Paddhati, which is a simple uh, permutation combination. I'll give you, let us consider just three notes. The first three notes. So it's always, it's fixed solfa. We don't uh, consider a moving solfege in Indian system. So now it's, do is fixed for me. Do, do, re, mi, da, da, da. So, so three notes. Sa, ri, ga. So this is one combination. What are the other combinations? Put it in any order you want. Let us say one, two, three. Oh, oh Sarega, you know Sarega. Sarega. Can you sing? Sarega. Perfect. Now, can you give me a different combination? Perfect. Ga, sari. Same thing. Re, ga, sa. Another combination. Sa, ga, re. So I have exhausted all the possibilities on these three notes now. All I need to do to improvise is use these three notes, I mean, before I proceed any further, in different order, different combinations. I mean, now we just considered 
all the triplets. So now just these three notes can open an entire universe of music. So just on three notes, I can elongate the first note, shorten the second, and shorten the third, and different combinations, I mean, sky is the limit. I'll just give you an example, just using these three notes. I'm using that combination. But now the improvisatory part comes and you know you have heard so much of this music from great masters when you're improvising, you get a new idea. So you want to, you feel like elongating the third note or shortening the second and so on. So this method is called the Khandameru Padhati, which was, which is a uh, reference for which you can find in the classical treatises on Indian classical music, like Sangeet Ratnakara. These already, these are all composed in the early, uh, some of them in uh, second century AD and, this was in 13th century. Sangeet Ratnakara was in 13th century. So you can find a mention about these techniques. What I about to say? See, yeah, I can see I got distracted. Yeah, these are just three notes. And uh, so you listen to your ma maestros and then you get a different inspiration. And then sometimes you create something on your own. That's about, now it's only for three notes. Now if you have four, already your options are more. So now I'm adding the fourth note. I'm adding the fourth now. Now instead of taking only combinations of four, I can have any combination. So in Indian music, we have what is known as the gamaka and the mind. So it's the gliding from one note to the other. with the dynamics, make it just that on this instrument, P, 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 P doesn't sound. Mm -hmm. The pianissimo doesn't sound. So at least you need to have piano and mezzo piano and yeah, forte is good. Then, you know, when you build up, you go to a grand crescendo and then you start playing with it. to give you an example. So now you start introducing dynamics and you have these key phrases and then you have this Merukhan Padati. So improvisation is easy. You can go home and try. <laughs> yeah. I will, I think, start with, now we'll introduce the second element. Now it's just the melodic element. We have the rhythmic element. My good friend and he's one of the most promising tabla players of our generation, and uh, one of the senior disciples of world-renowned maestro Pandit, Anindo Chatterjee. And so we'll have, we will play something together, and then I'll let him talk about his instrument. That'll give me some rest. Mm -hmm.
So what we just now did was he played a solo and I accompanied him. <coughs> so what I was playing is known as the Lehra. It's kind of, I don't know, what's the origin of the word Lehra? Is it from Leher by any chance? Leher actually means the wave. So I think it kind of gives a wave, I don't know. Yeah, maybe he can talk about his instrument and then we'll do something together and then we will play the grand finale. A very good afternoon to everybody. Um, so, I'll just talk a few words about tabla and the language of tabla. As most of you know, you know, tabla is a pretty popular instrument. I'm sure most of you would have seen and heard it somewhere or the other. But uh, anybody who has studied tabla in the room, apart from Harsha, of course. Oh, nice. So then uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, the, how the instrument is made. So basically it's a two-piece drum um, made out of coat skin on both the drums while the right hand drum is made out of wood the left hand drum is usually made out of copper or of steel. Usually copper gives a better quality of sound and then uh, you know as you can see there are multiple layers of goat skin over here. So on both the drums. In fact um, the the upper layer is also completely covered with goat skin and then they cut the goat skin to uh, make something known as the kinar so the part where i'm striking now it's called the kinar and the, and the sound that i'm making is called na or ta so just like any other language even tabla has its own syllables and phrases and words and uh, you can even make sentences and paragraphs and go on so, um, and then you, you also see some kind of a sp special thing in the middle. Uh, it's called the shahi. It's made out of a, it's like a, a stone powder mixed with rice and then they put it on in layers. And each layer that they put, they have to um, rub the shahi uh, for a while and make sure that it's even and they have to dry it out in the sun. So just preparing the shahi can, you know, take a few days of work for a single tabla. And it's because of this shahi that the tabla can actually be tuned to a tonic. So most, if you look at the western drums, it is usually not tuned to any particular note. And if you look at the, um, the kanjira, I'm not sure if you guys uh, know what the kanjira is. It's like a handheld drum. Uh, which is usually played with just the right hand. Um, so even that instrument uh, is usually not tuned to any particular note, which is the case with most of the percussion instruments. And uh, certain instruments and most, in, uh, like, I think I see this only in the Indian instruments, right? The mridangam and the tabla and the ghatam, which are an exception, which are tuned to a particular tonic. And the shahi actually gives the ability um, for the tabla to be tuned to a particular tonic. So uh, you can see that uh, the shahi is applied on the left hand drum as well, which is the bass drum. And uh, this is usually not tuned to any particular tonic as such. Um, like usually this has to be on the sa. Like sa. So this is usually tuned to sa on the right hand drum. And the left hand drum is just tuned um, to the same note like throughout. If, you if I just keep moving the left hand drum, you will not hear too much of a difference in the tuning. Usually there will be a very like minute difference you know, because of the pressure of playing and all that. But usually it is tuned to one particular note, but it doesn't have to be to sa or any other uh, specific note. It can be to any, uh, any note. So uh, this is how the tabla is made. And then uh, you were already, like, I think you saw me using the hammer to tune the tabla. So usually what happens is, um, you know, this, this uses these uh, strings which 
uh, hold the tension for the tabla and we also use these wooden um, these wooden blocks or pegs uh, to uh, uh, to hold the tension or to bring it down or to uh, to bring it up so let's say uh, how i can just demonstrate how i tune the tabla i can we increase the volume on So as I strike it from below, you can notice that the, the tone is going down. So it is now almost in ni, somewhere between ni and sa. Ni, sa. So I need to bring it there. So when I strike it from above, it, it, the tension goes higher and it, it gets tuned to sa. So I can I can use the wooden pegs also to do the do the same. So the the major tuning is done using the wooden pegs, and the minor tuning is usually done. Uh, the minor adjustments are do, done here, at the top. So even if I move the wooden blocks, if I move the wooden wooden blocks up again, the the note is going to come down to me, and then if I can uh, take bring it down, it's going to bring it up to sa. to be tuned to the same note all over otherwise it's not going to sound this way I mean the resonance is not going to be there so now coming to some of the phrases and some of the syllables uh, I'll just say the syllable and then uh, play it and then I'll come to a few phrases and a few sentences so na or it's also called ta ti tin or thun thun Tin, tak, dhere dhere. Now coming to the left hand syllables, it has very few. Uh, it's ghe, kat. So when I play ghe and ta together, tha. And when I play ghe and tin together, dhin. So now. So that we played in a tal called Teen Tal, uh, which is a 16 beat cycle, and it is just made up of two syllables, dha and dhin. And you know, ta and tin as well. Uh, so it goes like this dha, dhin, dhin, dha, dha, dhin, dhin, dha, dha, tin, tin, ta, ta, dhin, dhin, dha. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one. So a few phrases now. Dhatit. Dhadhatit. Ghenatit. Kradhatit. Dhage traka dhina gina. Dhage nage dhina gina. Dhati dhage tina gina. Tati dhage dhina gina. Now a little longer. Dhakra dhati dhagena dhati dhage tina gina. Dhatraka dhati dhagena dhati dhage tina gina. Takr tati take na tati take tu na ke na dhatra ka dhati dhage na dhati dhage dhi na ke na. So now 
I start to improvise using just these two phrases. Dhakar dhati dhage na dhati dhage tu na ke na dhatrak dhati dhage na dhati dhage tu na ke na. So I can make various combinations and permutations, just like how uh, Deepak ji explained on the using the Merukhan technique. It's more of permutation and combination, but you don't use the individual syllables, but you use the phrases. For instance, dhati dhage ti na ke na. So you can use dhage tu na ke na as a phrase. Dhage ti na ke na or ti na ke na as a phrase, but you don't use na ke na or uh, just the na. So there are there are a few phrases. There are a few ways in which you can break it down into smaller chunks, and you can use those in different various combinations. So now I will just uh, present uh, Rela, a composition known as a Rela, which is usually played in high speed, and usually which doesn't have too many improvisations. So uh, we'll just uh, present it for you. Hope you like it. Still tin tal, drut tin tal. Da din din da da din din da da din din da. Pick a din din da. One two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen. Sarangi and the different genres in, it, in which it was used. As I said, in, in the Indian classical music, it was used as an accompanying instrument, and there are so many sub-genres of music uh, within the Indian mainstream classical music. You have the Tumri, which are light compositions, and, and the Dadra, Chaiti, which are seasonal songs, and there are different ritual songs, there are boatman songs, you know. Um, again, so this instrument was used in almost all the genres and there are different types of sarangi, some of the folk instruments and the techniques that are used are also different. And uh, there are predominantly two schools of sarangi playing. So most sarangi players, they use the index finger to play the first, uh, first two notes. Sarega. and the fourth and fifth with the middle finger. And everything else with the ring finger. It's all with this finger, ring finger. But the school to which I belong, Pandit Ramnar, and he's the only Sarangi player who perhaps plays only Ri and Dha with the index finger. Everything else with this and this. So.
and he has his own ways of negotiating some phrase de 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 no and there are some folk songs and what happens to a sarangi player is our ears are very very sharp so our ear training is i think perhaps the best among all other instrumentalists because we are we have to accompany all the time and we should get all these subtle phraseologies and uh, so as soon as we hit mm -hmm, so immediately we know what exactly has to be done and what figure combinations have to be used and this there are gamaks for there are some schools in which they have an aggressive way of singing So even you have the you know it's getting translated in your sari sari sa bani da ma sa sa ma pa da sari sa bani da ma so immediately you have this now the equivalent notes it it comes like a picture in front of you what is it called eidetic memory yeah it's some kind of an eidetic memory which is real time it happens there sometimes you don't remember it but you would have reproduced it the way it has to be done so we'll probably give a uh, now i think i should have can we do something together and then play a short piece or i'll play a short piece which is a uh, a folk song in the same rag and then we'll do something to i mean you can ask me to stop any time <laughs> uh, my acting teacher professor david barnett you know he had he used to get distracted he was trained in the classical school of acting you know shakespearean acting and he would go tangential he would want to share his experience and he would realize oh i'm in the classes shut up david <laughs> and then he would continue so you can this if you if i go you can ask me to shut up <laughs> <laughs> as is said uh, the the previous piece was uh, set to a tal called teen tal which is a 16 beat it's 4 by 4 basically 4 by 4 and in different combinations and uh, we have 108 different rhythm cycles but among them only four are popular the teen tal rupak jap tal and ek tal and some maestros would sing in jhumra which are I mean, now i think not many right yeah in the south indian music system again there are seven prominent tals but all of them are not popular just the i mean i think it's the human uh, way of thinking you know we are in that comfort zone the most comfortable is the 4 by 4 no matter what and okay we are we can stretch our imagination to uh 3 by 4 or 6 by 8 but anything beyond that requires special attention 7 8 or no 5 8 you need special attention in the same way here as well uh, those tals are are uh, not as often performed as these regular ones I mean, there are some really weird tals in south indian system it as i said the 108 system so there are different it, it's called anga so in indian uh, south indian classical music we don't usually depend on the tabla in uh, north indian classical music tabla is indispensable which is why these guys are you know they act pricey sometimes <laughs> uh in carnatic music you don't have the problem we it's always performed with you know by clapping your hand ಕಲಿಗಿತ ಫಲ ದಲಿಗಿ 
So you can just clap and you, know, you have the rhythm cycle. But in Hindustani, we, have, we want that, you know, Kali Thali it is called. Kali is this and Thali is the clap and when you wave it's called the Kali. So there are some Thals in South Indian system which have weird, uh, uh, how do I put it, way of showing. Say for example, you clap and then you do this, do this and what is lacking is this, you know. You know yeah, go for it, <laughs> we don't do that. <clears throat> So this composition is in the 6-8 rhythm cycle. It's called the Yektal, which is 12-beat cycle. And uh, usually it is performed in fast tempo. But this composition is in slow tempo, but I will show how it is performed in... Hmm. <laughs> So it's usually performed in this tempo. Here is a composition which is performed in slow tempo. And it's, uh, it's a very popular uh, uh, light devotional, it's not exactly devotional, it is, it depicts the mood of separation. Tumbris are usually uh, composed to depict the mood of separation from your beloved.
can use this or uh, which rhythm cycle do you prefer you want this or you want four by four uh, how, how do we have a good uh, representation of SEA TV here any uh, how many bass voices do you do we have Ooh, wow. <laughs> okay <laughs> very few uh, and how many altos tenors I know all of you <laughs> and, and okay any sopranos Wow, there we have sopranos. Good. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so we'll use this as. Uh, or should we use this? You know what? Uh, there is a nice Kurdish tune in the same rag. We can use that and try to do something together. You know, some kind of you know, how how to superimpose the Indian music and improvisation and some voicings and how we go about it. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's okay. You can we have some basses? Some 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 someone some of you can volunteer to sing the bass and tenor and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'll just tell you about the tune. It's a Kurdish folk song, uh, which was, uh, I think it belongs, it's a traditional song. And, can you sing all of you and then we can see how to voice it la 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 wonderful so the basses will go See, uh, when we Indian musicians compose, as I said, we have these phrases here. So the composition is very spontaneous. And we have... All the basses. Okay, so these are the basses. And tenor and alto can sing the melody. All right? La, 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 And basses. La, 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 la. La 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 Go ahead. Now we we'll let's sing the same thing in the Indian solfege. Sa ni da pa ma ga re sa re ga re ma ga re sa ni sa. Is it too much? <laughs> it's okay. We'll try. 
Go for it. So when we are improvising, you keep going and I'll show you how we improvise on this. Rhythmic cadences, which are called dithihais in North Indian classical music and muktaya in the South Indian music. So anything that is sung thrice, it's called tihai, thrice. Can I have go forte? <laughs> you want someone to conduct? Chikti hai torso. Chikti hai torso. Tata, <laughs> 
So these are all, you know, singing triplets in four by four, and you have, you can sing five eights. Thank you. We'll uh, play a fast piece and Dhrit and uh, I'll show one last technique on Sarangi, which was developed by uh, Grammy winner Pandit Dhrubhoshji who drew inspiration. As I said, it's a continuous instrument, mostly playing the vocal music. So he uh, introduced the elements of sitar and plucking into sarangi, which was quite a revolution. I mean, it was unheard of until then. He took lessons from Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, and uh, he learned the saro techniques, and his brother, who is under whom I'm learning currently, he's a sitar player himself, so he he gave him some techniques. It's called Jhala. I'm sure if you have, if have I ever attended any uh, sitar concert, you have in the last, in, in, as, as the grand finale, uh, Tabla will be going in high speed. So the, these kind of phrases were, it was typical to only sitar, but he, he was able to emulate them on, on the sarangi. So he uses this technique, you know. Introduce these techniques, and we'll play something, and and we'll slowly crescendo, and then we'll go to this tempo and show some of these techniques, and we'll have Q and A maybe. Uh, most compositions, in particularly Hindustani music, they have the speak up phrase, and then you go to the first beat of the tal. Most of them, I would say nine out of ten. This composition too. Mm, 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 mm. Dava Gazari Gama Badava Dava Gazari. So Dava Gazari is the first bit. So, which is why these guys become so indispensable for us. Da din din da da din din da da din din da bagad. One two three four. One two three four. One two three. Da bagazari. So whatever embellishments, whatever improvisation we play or sing, so we always pay attention to this, and then it should always come on what is known as the sum or the first beat. So let us try it once, and then we'll we we both will play. So. Just keep the cycle in your mind. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 
One, two, three, da ba ga. So, so it starts on the twelfth beat. Da ba ga sa re. Da ba ga sa re. Ga ma ba da ba da ba ga sa re. Da ba ga sa re. Can you sing? Da ba ga sa re. And always pay attention to da din din da da din din da da tin tin. So that's the cue for you. Da din din da da din din da da tin tin. Da ba ga sa re. Ga ma ba da ba da ba ga sa re. So don't sing. Da ba ga sa re. Yeah, just give a pause. Give two cycles pause. Da ba ga sa re. That's right. So these are some of the common, uh, I would say, the pickup phrases. Get a little bit more volume on the sarangi, please.
questions? Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit how you approach uh, collaborating with musicians from different traditions. Oh yeah, sure. <coughs> So we are so hardwired in our Indian musicians. As I said, as soon as I hear a piece of music, it first gets translated to my, my system of notation. I mean, as soon as I hear a beat, 251 progression, or if it is, uh, when I was taking piano lessons uh, at the University of Alberta, this was the biggest problem. Every melody I would immediately you know, memorize because we are trained to memorize pieces. But it's so hard, suppose you're learning a piece by Chopin, say a nocturne. So and you have all those dynamics written, you have those PPP and F, everything. Uh, it's too hard to remember the whole piece, you know, unless and until you practice it so over and over again. And it sometimes, is very handy and sometimes it is uh, it, it can be disadvantageous so uh, so as an Indian musician the first thing that happens to me is I whether I mean I have tried very hard sometimes to think in terms of chords even the chords will always come as notes to me be it augmented diminished whatever you know it, it always comes as a as a note a series of uh, uh, notes to me. Uh, as I said, since our tunes are, uh, ears are very well tuned, uh, this, I was performing with a Middle Eastern music ensemble, and in music, Middle Eastern music you have these quarter notes, so which you're all familiar with. On, a, on other instruments it will be very difficult to get those quarter notes, especially on the Indian uh, instruments. Since sarangi is a continuous instrument, I could get the, for example, la 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 la. It's not exactly the uh, the the flat six. It's in between flat six and uh, the major six. So when you are playing that, so you you can exactly get that particular intonation. I mean, so when you are collaborating with Middle Eastern musicians, it's it's very handy, but. Uh, if you're playing with jazz musicians, is also it's fine. But if you're playing with classical musicians, then you're constrained, you know, to think exactly in in a particular sequence of chord progressions. Then you have to work on it. I mean, we we, we can't be at our best. Sometimes we play pre-composed phrases. I mean, I had to play with a symphony. Uh, then I had so many bars of music, and I had to play exactly in that chord progression, which was a little difficult. But if it is improvisatory, then that is, I think, we we'll, we'll love improvisation. And we, we, we don't like to be constrained. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, almost all those pieces, at least what I, I came in late, but um, they were all pretty much in like different modes of minor. Um, That's right. That's right. Are there like maybe like major tonalities also in some oh, of the songs? Oh, tons of them. Oh, I right. chose this melody. As I said, if I have to play a major uh, scale, I'll have to again retune. But I can, I'll, I'll just show you a, a quick, I can show it here, right, right here. of them. So how uh, the Indian rags are divided are based on uh, what is known as the Mela Karta system. It is again based on a simple uh, permutation and combination uh, of different notes. So you choose the minor third and you have an entire system of rags and you choose the major third you have an entire system of rags and then you choose the Tritone. So there are 36 uh, rags corresponding to tritones. I mean, these are the full scales, and you have what are known as Jania ragas, which are born offsprings out of these major, uh, major as in, I don't want to use the word major because it's confusing in this parlance, uh, the full scales. Uh, 
So there are a lot of offspring rocks that, that don't have the entire scale. There are pentatonic, and you have the pentatonic in the ascending, and you have in the descending, you may have the full scale. For example, there is a rock called Shuddha uh, Kalyan. Uh, so it has a pentatonic ascending. So whatever improvisation you do, it will be there are uh, too, too many of them, <laughs> yeah. I just chose uh, minor, har uh, melo uh, harmonic minor, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I said melodic minor, it's not melodic minor, it's harmonic. Yeah. Yes, please. So uh, both of you use your two different hands differently when playing your instruments. Are there players that uh, play with the wrong hands? Uh, not on this instrument <laughs> that I know of. Yeah. Like tabula, tabula, yes, there are yeah, quite, yeah, quite a few. OK. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Because there are very few players of Saragi, so asking them to play in the right hand might be a little, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> if there is somebody who's, yeah. Yeah. sorry, yeah. What kind of bow are you using? Oh, uh, this is a specially designed bow, which is, for, which is used for the Sarangi. My uh, teacher, uh, Grammy winner, Pandit Drubukhosh, he started experimenting with the double bass bow, and uh, he used to also use, I don't have it right, right away with me, uh, but th there is a short bow which is thick. Uh, it's used for uh, a folk instrument in, in somewhere in Europe, so he used to use that for getting these fast phrases, because this is too heavy, and it uses almost two and a half to three times as much hair as that of a violin bow, and it's also, the wood is quite heavy and thick. So for playing phrases like this, for these phrases, it becomes a little cumbersome. So uh, he used to use a smaller, lighter bow. Uh, say that again, sorry? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's played in upright position. The bow, uh, no, bow, OK. So we hold the bow. Uh, again, there are different schools. So some people hold it like this. And there are some people who say that you know it should be held like a gun, you know, like this. And then you put your hand, and so this rests on your middle finger. So you get the only support you get is the middle finger and these two. And I keep I use a combination of both, you know, depending on the phrase and the tempo. Yes, I, I was just, uh, about the uh, two questions about the tabla, if you don't mind. Uh, the, um, uh, given the amount of work that goes into the heads, uh, how often does one replace a head? Um, it depends on the, the quality of the head and also a lot on the weather. And yeah, so I mean, um, probably this head, I got it like five years ago and it's still lasting. So it, it also depends on how you maintain the head. You know, now I have tuned it to E, so the tension is pretty high. But immediately after the concert, I have to bring it down. I have to bring it and, uh, uh, you know, maintain it in D or in uh, C sharp. So so then, you know, the, there's not too much pressure on the, on the head. So only when I'm playing the concert, just before the concert, I tune it to E. So that way it lasts a little longer. But I have had heads which have broken in a, a couple of days and have also lasted like five, six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, w I would assume that traveling is also a complication. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then the other one, uh, other question I had was, um, how, given uh, the um, pliability, especially of the left hand drum, uh, to, to change the pitch, how sure. high impact of a percussion instrument is it for your hands? Uh, it, we, we, where would you rate it in terms of like hand percussion, uh, in terms of the impact on your, your hands? Uh, well, I don't play other uh, percussions other than the mridangam, so um, I don't think I can rate it uh, that way. 
However, uh, I don't think it's really difficult on the fingers, you know, because it's uh, like years and years of practice that has gone in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really don't require too much of a, a pressure or, or force from your hands. Uh, it's just that your fingers get uh, trained in a particular way. You know, the weight automatically comes as, as you keep playing. You know, the fingers also, the, the muzzle on the, in the fingers also gets uh, developed in the right way as you keep playing. And uh, yeah, I think that's how it builds up. It's not, not too much force required. Thank you. Yes, please. How long do you have to uh, Usually uh, about in uh, six months or, or in a year. Now, uh, there was a time when there were no sarangi makers. I mean, even now there are, I think, only a couple in India. But there are no, the, the traditional sarangi makers are, are no more because not many players. Uh, so we started using uh, the harp strings, which is easily available and also gives better sound. So now string is not a problem, fortunately. Uh, but otherwise, they, you know, back then when I started learning, I had to place an order and wait for three months and you would get some poor, cheap quality string and you're not happy with the sound. And for a long time, this was a, a guarded secret. Many Sarangi players did not you know, reveal where they got their strings. <laughs> and uh, yeah, fortunately, I had a friend you know, who, who was kind enough, and also my teacher, Pandit Ram Naranji. He, so he buys his, his strings from a particular shop in London. So whenever I go to London, I bring loads of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, uh, what pitch is the uh, so these are always tonic, the fifth lower, and the tonic in the lower the most. So it, it, this would be <coughs> E4 and, and uh, the fifth of that and uh, the E3. And then the drone strings are tuned to the scale? Sorry? The drone strings are tuned to oh, the scale? Oh, here, uh, uh, not exactly. So I must explain this. So here there are four sets of strings. So this set and this set. And you have this this set so these three sets of strings one that runs you know on top of the instrument and one that is here by the side of this peg this, this set of pegs these are tuned to the scale and there is another set which is tuned in chromatic and this string is always you know we go for what is known as the desi string which is the locally available string because uh, harp doesn't produce a very good sound for the lower uh, tonic. But these two, I think, no other sarangi string sounds so good. Uh, harp is the best. Yeah. Are the, uh, the dots on, uh, are those decorative or are they positional? Sorry? Are the, the dots that are lining the, what, what I would say is the fingerboard, for lack these of a are These ones? Yeah. Oh, no, so they're just, uh, it, we call it full uh, flower. I mean, it looks like a flower. So the strings run through these uh, dots. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. so it's like, it acts as a small bridge, yeah. and it has a speaking length. Oh. So depending on where where the string is. So the, the, the length, length keeps decreasing mm -hmm. as you go uh, further and further towards the main bridge. So the uh, frequency also keeps increasing. So same, likewise here. Yeah. Uh, so could you play a song by like plucking? Pr by what? Like plucking the strings. Plucking? Yeah. Oh, uh, no. It's not possible. Yeah, yeah we just, just you know create the illusion sometimes. You know? That's it. I mean, it's you can't you can't play it like the dulcimer or or the santur. Could I ask why? Is it because of like how the instrument is designed? No, you can Your fingers don't reach uh, these strings because they are uh, they are stuck to the body of the instrument, and they are, you don't find the elevation you know that is necessary so that your fingers can easily reach and play. So we just, you know, before we begin a concert, we just, to give uh, 
a sense of what we are playing and create an effect. So we usually strum them like this. That's the best you can do. Thank you. So like when you change your strings, how do you keep from getting carpal tunnel? Because I know like... Uh, so, sorry, say that again? Like... If I change the strings, what? So like when we... Pr for people who play like upright bass, when we change our strings, like generally we use some kind of tool or something so we don't hurt our wrists doing it. Like with 40 strings, how do you get around that? Oh, it, it's, it's a mega event, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Changing strings is a, is a big event. You, know, you don't accept concerts for those many days, some two, three days. You, it requires a lot of patience, you know, removing each one of them and you have all kinds of tools. Uh, you actually copy a, I mean, carry a copy of the instrument. Mm -hmm. Just that you don't have this body. Otherwise, you carry everything, these strings, these pegs. And so it's tuned using this key. Uh, like. And then you remove this. And you know, even to get this through this hole, there is a special tool. So you actually you carry a toolkit. Mm. Mm. Okay, any more questions? I feel free. We still have ten more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Yeah. Are we done or do we? We have, as you said, we have 10 more minutes. Okay, I'm happy to ask more questions. Oh, yeah, please. Anyone please. else want to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, for example, when you're writing for a group that's not just Indian musicians and you mm -hmm. want to add harmony, mm -hmm. say you have a melody from a famous composition mm -hmm. and you want to add harmony to it, mm -hmm. can you give some advice to go about that? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, in Indian music, the rules of raga are pretty strict. So there are rags that are called the Mishra rags, which means mixed, so in which you can take liberty. So the one I played was a pure, purer form of Kirwani. There is what is known as the Mishra Kirwani, in which you can take liberty. You can also, in, in fact, Mishra Kirwani, and there is a rag called Mishra Bhairavi. You can use all the 12 notes. So, for example. <laughs> But the classical rags, the pure classical rags, you can't. So they're very, very touchy about it. Mm -hmm. So when you're harmonizing, uh, say there is a rag called. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Malkons. I know you chose the toughest of them. It's a pentatonic <laughs> rag. Uh, there are only five notes. <laughs> harmonizing a composition in this rag, for example, your options are limited. So you just have to stick to these five notes and get uh, So make, you can keep shifting the tonic, make the third as a tonic and then get a chord. So your options are limited if you're harmonizing a pure classical piece. Or you can you can harmonize the way we harmonize in the jazz or western using all you know added thirteen uh, added eleven anything only in a mitra rag you you don't have the scope in a, in a in a regular composition. The idea is not to add too much, but you want to still keep the essence of it. That's right, and also 
I mean, first of all, the rag limits itself and doesn't yield itself to harmonizing. And uh, also, the grammar of the rag is very stringent and strict. So it's, it's, they say it's parsimoniously defined. So the rag is it's, it's very tight and terse. So you have to stick to it. So it actually eliminates a lot of combinations, you, uh, which is why you can't even, in some rags, use the 251, the, the celebrated 251. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's basically you just stick to those notes and harmonize. And uh, just a moment, I'm sorry. So uh, in uh, Indian music, we don't stick to a progression because the progression depends on the rag. So it's just a phrase. You know? it's, it's based on the phrase. Instead of going from uh, one, four, five, one, or five, seven, we, you know, we can't use five, seven in many rags. Yes, please. Uh, oh yeah, lot lots of modes. There are you see, yeah. This this itself is, uh, but yeah. Th if you actually uh, shift the tonic, this can give you some some pentatonic sense of uh, uh, the, the pentatonic scale that is very popular in the Chinese music. Uh, the one that I played now, but there are rags called uh, darbari, uh, you know, which is a quintessential Indian rag because it has what is known as uh, an oscillating. Uh, uh, how, how do I? Yeah, you can call it oscillating. It's called kampit, you know, kampit gadhar, which means it's an oscillating uh, third, an oscillating da, for example. No? If you, I think you should check out the Melakarta system uh, on the Google, so you'll be able to read about how it's M-E-L-A-K-A-R-T-A, -A -A, Melakarta system. So you will get an idea of how these rags are derived and uh, the, the system of uh, you know uh, deriving the 72 full scales and from them how to get the offsprings and so on. Shivan and Major Shah Kesha for this thank wonderful presentation and thank you all for coming. And thanks for singing the wonderful chorus, all the CATV voices. So give a give a round of applause to yourselves. It was, you guys are sounding so good. Trust me. In fact, we could have you know recorded a piece right here, a jamming session. It's recorded. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you so much. I, again, thank I think so Professor much. Shukla is here. Uh, so we express our heartfelt thanks to Professor Shukla, the LearnQuest, and Professor Rekhaji. Thank you very much.